Okay. Uh, so after a very long journey over many and many deep generative models, today we're going to discuss diffusion models. The creme de la creme nowadays. Uh, uh, and I've been discussing about this topic with several people. And it feels that everybody feels that score-based models, generative diffusion models are are that good that perhaps, uh, you know, like that's it, like now it's mostly engineering. So, but it's for, for all of us, for you, the young generation to challenge this. Uh, I'm not really entirely convinced. It's not like they're working everywhere. Um, so the question is whether whatever doesn't work, is it because of, uh, you know, not good enough engineering or not good enough science? Either way, I'm going to discuss today the score-based models and the fusion models that are related uh, to a very certain degree, um, and also explain uh, why why them. You know what, what makes it uh, makes them tick. But before that, I I think it's very important to understand or to like to have the the basic principles at least in terms of the problems that are being solved, uh, straight. So last time we saw energy-based models, right? Um, what is good about energy-based models? And then like that's going to motivate also today's lecture. So what is good about energy-based models? Well, a generative model is a probability distribution, right? So it's a nominator and a denominator. And there's always an integral, right? And there's always tractability versus flexibility dilemma. So energy-based models, are they more flexible or are they more tractable? More flexible, right? Yes. Why they're more flexible? Yeah. So. Uh, they are very flexible because you're very flexible in how you can define the nominator in your probability to function, right? If you're using the exponential, which is nice and convenient, of f of x, and then <coughs> you integrate over. You're very flexible in the sense that you've got. What does flexibility mean? Actually, in your opinion. So, if I give you a line here, a function which is a line, is it flexible or not? Whereas, do I have more chalk? Do you see? On the back. So is a line function, is it flexible or not? No, right? Because if I have points that are like that, a line will never be able to fit. And by line, I mean the family of lines, right? Like you can have infinite lines, but no lines of these infinite lines. Whatever you can do, you cannot bend it, right? Is uh, is uh, like an x squared. Is it flexible? More flexible than a line. Right, exactly. It's more flexible than a line, but it's not perfectly flexible. If you have an n or n the polynomial, quite flexible. Quite flexible, right? What, what does, so, what does flexibility mean? Complexity of the function you have to the data. Exactly. So, if you have a flexible function, it's a function which in principle, like if every, in, in learning, we're defining families of functions and we pick the best one, let's say, right? Like that's what you're optimizing. When you're optimizing, you're optimizing for the best line out of many lines. And a flexible uh, model is when your line, your curve, more precisely, can take any arbitrary shape that you want and hopefully 
any arbitrary shape that is in your data. So a flexible model is one that you can very easily modify and fit your data, right? So an energy-based model is flexible because basically you've got very few constraints to satisfy when, uh, when defining the model. Like an MLP, for instance, is very flexible, right? And basically there is no constraint. It can fit, that's why it's also a universal function approximator. A normalizing flow is not that flexible because it has to be in vertical, for instance, or because uh, uh, in practice you have to be able to compute tractably the log determinant of the Jacobian. So whatever you define, you cannot define any MLP and say, okay, that's my normalizing flow. I have to have a very specific definition. I have, uh, I'm, I'm constraining the set of possible functions and the set of possible neural networks that can implement this. So an energy-based model is very flexible because here there is very few constraints, right? Basically, you can put whatever you want in the f of x, and that's good enough. For as long as you can compute the normalizing constant, right? And that's why energy-based models are flexible. However, they're not very easily tractable. Because how do you compute this? There's always an integral, and there's always ways you can approximate. You can also say, you can also make stupid approximation. Like right? nothing stops you from doing stupid approximation. The problem with stupid approximation is that it's going to give you a stupid result. So you want, want to have an approximation which is good enough, or as close enough as the ideal, right? So this is the good thing about the energy-based models. Energy-based models have the capacity to actually learn uh, for us very good distributions and. Distributions is all about the generative models is all about distributions. However, we've got the practical problem of how do we compute the normalization constant. Well, score-based models, in fact, help with this because they are similar to an energy-based model, while. Uh, Avoiding for us the, the requirement to explicitly compute the normalization constant. And that's why they work so well. <coughs> so I'm going to give you an introduction to score matching, uh, noise conditional score networks, score based generations via SDEs, and diffusion models today. Now, these are the initial papers uh, that uh, discussed. Uh, uh, that, that started the diffusion and score-based, um, let's say, framework. Uh, by now, there's many more, uh, of course, uh, stable diffusion and whatnot, but um, yeah, I don't have to. Unfortunately, I, I, I discovered that even six uh, lectures of a module are not enough for uh, giving you a very good overview of everything, so we have to squeeze them in. Maybe next year, I'm going to completely redesign the course. Uh, Right, so tractability versus flexibility. This is core. Like, if anything, from this course, you should, in, in deep gender models, you should always remember that. Uh, uh, in generative modeling, there are two opposing forces tractability and flexibility. The simpler your functions, the easier to compute them, to manipulate them, so they're more tractable, but they're also stupider, so they cannot fit uh, well enough complex patterns in the data. The more complex a function, the harder it is to compute. So it's a very logical trade-off. Tractable models are usually analytically computable and easy to evaluate, to fit, to sample from. Uh, but they're not flexible enough to learn the true data structure. Flexible models can fit arbitrary structures in data, but they're usually too expensive, or too hard, or even intractable. So we haven't discussed in this module about like implicit generative models, like GANs. Uh, I assume that you did this in Deep Learning 1. Either way, GANs are not super popular right now, but uh, I'm sure more le you know about GANs in general, right? Or how they work. Uh, Likelihood-based generative models, well, we've seen them, uh, like autoregressive models. Uh, or VAs, RVAs, likelihood-based generative, do they 
do VAs maximize likelihood? Let me see. No. There is no grade here, like, uh, like on this, like just, just like have a conversation. So no, why not? Exactly. So VAs approximate maximum likelihood, but they don't actually really maximize likelihood. They maximize the uh, elbow. However, okay, let's put them together with uh, other likelihood-based general models. So they typically make strong assumptions to ensure tractability of likelihood, like that you've got a tractable latent, uh, like a tractable distribution in your latent space. Uh, usually, this is on uh, the normalizing constant. So you have to somehow uh, uh, manipulate your model, make only manipulate, but um, define your model such that it is easy to either compute z or it is easy to approximate z well enough. For instance, the VAs assume a tractable variational approximation. Autoregressive models assume causal convolution, so you cannot have like in, like in standard convolution, you cannot have like very weird types of architectures. They have to conform to some form of causality. So like future pixels cannot inform previous pixels. And of course this constrains the architecture, right? Like so this makes the architecture less flexible. Normalizing flows require invertibility in the network architecture. So likelihood models, likelihood-based models so far, one way or the other, make some strong assumption. Right? Without such a strong assumption, it's just impossible to have a reasonable estimation of the log likelihood. And if you don't have a reasonable estimation of the log likelihood here, how can you optimize for the max, like how can you maximize the likelihood that it's impossible, correct? Yeah. And implicit generative models like GANs rely on the shell training, uh, which is very unstable because it's this minimax game. And this minimax game by definition do, do you understand why guns are, do you know, uh, have, you, have you done with guns in deep learning one actually? I don't remember. Right. So it's this minimax game, right? So it's like this subtle point. <coughs> right, so you're literally trying to uh, be like in this, like such a point where it's minimum for one slice of your optimization landscape and maximum for another uh, slice of the optimization landscape. So it's, it's maximum for this here, right? And then minimum for that. Well, anyways, into this, uh, hard to draw, but uh, I guess you understand the point. But anyways, that makes it very unstable, right? If it's very unstable, it means if, if, if the loss landscape is very unstable, it means that the optimizer has a very hard job of uh, like finding a good solution. It's like, uh, you know, if you're, 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 you're you know, if you're, my, you're a model and then I ask you, you know, to be good students and also, I don't know, like uh, throw rocks very far away. Like these are two perhaps conflicting requirements and then what should I do? Um, that's why adversarial training leads often to mode collapse. So it finds, the model finds solutions that are comfortable enough, good enough, uh, but they don't cover the whole space of data. So they paint pictures, let's say, of uh, flowers, but of only one flower. So they make really good, uh, I don't know, like tulips, but nothing else. Um, also, implicit general models cannot compute the likelihood of a sample, so you can actually, it's very hard to use them uh, for any probabilistic inference. Now, these are two models, like two family of models, if we, or we can consider these two family of models, and next week, a new one, a score-based general model. So that's like a new way of um, uh, checking at it. And uh, diffusion score matching models are both tractable and flexible. And that's why we've got now these DALIs and uh, mid-journey and uh, stable diffusion and, and whatnot. So score matching. Energy-based models, a recap. Um, 
Right. So this is the energy-based model right here. Um, here F is energy. Uh, we cannot ignore the normalization constant during training. We can, and depending on the operation we're doing uh, after training, so once we've got the model, but during training we cannot because it also depends on parameters. So it's not really constant during training. Um, and for general functions and architectures, it is intractable to compute the integral. So it's very hard to maximize. And as we said, the good thing about energy-based models is because um, uh, they are not like, they don't have specific modes, they're very flexible. They can cover the entirety of space with good coverage, like they can assign a probability everywhere. So they don't uh, need to overfit on all, uh, they don't need to ignore data, they don't have to have uh, underestimated variance or overestimated variance. Uh, if, if, uh, if done correctly. However, they've got the problem of intractability. Score-based models don't have that. Some um, motivation uh, slides, they, uh, uh, they, they, they make really good visualizations, so very good generations. They are energy-based models, with, therefore with gun-like quality of uh, generation, uh, while having the advantage of explicit probabilistic models. So unlike guns, you can use them for probabilistic inference uh, and whatnot. Um, so the score function is central to score-based models. And the score function is, uh, Stein's score function, is just the gradient of the log likelihood with respect not to the parameters now of the model, but with respect to the uh, uh, x variable, to the variable the observed variable here. So this is uh, a gradient field, it's a, right? Because, so it's not just like, um, uh, it's a field, it's not just one vector. Because you have to take the gradient of your probability with respect to all the dimensions, uh, x. So x is multi-dimensional, right? So this is not, uh, this is a field. <coughs> Um, and uh, a model, S theta, which tries to simulate, to approximate the score function explicitly, is a score-based model. So score-based models are models like that, that they try to look like the gradient of the log likelihood uh, with respect uh, to uh, the input variable x. That's it. Now, okay, this is the very high level. The obvious question is, so what? Um, yeah, so here you see the score function of a mixture of two dogs, right? Like, so this is your probability landscape, and then you see for each location x, you've got the gradient field. So for each location x, you've got a vector pointing to where, basically, uh, uh, this quantity increases. So if I am in this location, this arrow tells me that if I move along this direction, my log probability will become higher, right? So the score function is a field, is a function over, uh, well, 2D in this case, which points me to a direction of where the likelihood is maximized locally at least, right? Because the gradient is a local linear operation. Is this clear? <coughs> now, the good thing about the score function is that it does not depend on any normalizing constant. So P of X, that's why it's an energy-based model, right? So P of X, I can have an energy-based model, or, or basically this means I can define a model in such a form. If I try to compute its score function, I get no normalizing constant. This is my uh, score function, or the model that tries to approximate the score function, um, which is the gradient of the logarithm of the probability. Then it's minus the denominator, the exponential cancels out. 
with the logarithm minus the gradient of the uh, log normalizing constant. And this does not, so the gradient here is with respect to x, right? Z of t integrates over x, so x is not uh, a quantity anymore, a relevant quantity for the normalizing constant, which means that this goes to zero. Is this clear? So the score function has this really nice quality that to compute it, to compute, you don't have to compute the normalizing constant. So what to optimize, however, uh, here is the question, uh, because you know my so my function here is literally let's say a unit. You can think of it as a unit, which is basically also how they are implemented. model, my probability function, which has this form, x uh, e of minus f x over z theta, right? This is one function from, so p of x is a function from r d to r, right? Well, the positive. one dimension. So P of X gives you one number, like probability. The score function, let's put the theta form here for completeness. The score function is the gradient of X, the degree with respect to X of the logarithm of the local likelihood. <coughs> so what is the, let's say the, what does the function look like? So it goes from Rd to the dimensionality of x, right? So Rd as well. So in terms of a neural network, you can think of it as this is my x. has d dimensions, this will also have d dimensions, right? Okay. Okay, so big deal, whatever. The units also like that, right? But here we want to do unsupervised learning because we've got bit general models and we want to maximize somehow likelihood. One way or the other, that's how, like that's the driving principle behind our optimization. But with units you've got the same thing, but uh, with units usually you've got segmentation masks here, right? So the maximum likelihood is with respect to the annotations we have. Here, what is the ground truth, let's say, let's put in quotes, here. What is the ground truth of, of this? We don't have it, right? We don't really know what is the optimal. I mean, that's what we're trying to learn. So that's the main question here. Sure, we found a clever way of defining a function such that we don't have a normalizing constant. But okay, what are we going to optimize? Well, we can minimize the Fisher divergence, we can say, let's start with that, um, of our score function approximator from the true score, uh, the true score function. Okay, nothing really new yet. Here it's just a theoretical thing because this we don't really know, correct? What is so great about it, though, is that a long time ago, in 2005, and uh, later on in 2019, it was shown that this thing here, so the logarithm of the true probability, so the gradient, so anyway, the true score function minus the approximation of the score function squared can be approximated by this term the trace of the gradient of the score function plus 
its norm. Some form of its norm. Now, what is good about it? You don't have the true probability distribution, right? So, no depends on the ground truth score gradients anymore. We can literally now optimize without requiring true distributions, optimal ideal distributions anymore. However, we still have a problem that this thing here can be very expensive to compute because we need to compute the Jacobian. So the Jacobian of the score function can be really, really huge. For large networks and approximations are needed. There are two approximations that were and are popular, or they were proposed at least in the beginning. One is called the noising score matching, and both they are trying to sort of uh, uh, avoid for us uh, computing explicitly or completely the trace of the Jacobian. The one is the noise score matching, which works uh, well for small level of noise. So basically, you can rewrite. It can be shown. It was shown in this paper here. Uh, but you can, you can rewrite this nice form that when actually optimized, but it's very expensive. By this uh, uh, term, for which in which we have no trace of Jacobians. So here is um, uh, we first sample a training example from the training set. Here, then we just add, we sprinkle it with a little bit of noise to the ex uh, example here. So basically, this is the guy here, right? the, the operation here, and we try to minimize the difference between. Uh, the score function as computed, as estimated. So the score function is our neural network. We pass our noised up sample through our neural network. We obtain one, one image of gradient, whatever. So that's like an image, basically. You can think of it as an image. Minus, uh, let's say, the score function of this uh, noise dub distribution that we can define easily and nicely and make sure that it, you know, it's like uh, easy to compute. This prob the, the problem with this approach, however, is that we're literally adding noise to the samples. So if you add too much, you're basically sort of destroying your observation, right? So it works, but you should not make uh, add too much noise. This is a Monte Carlo which means that you can uh, do it multiple times and then minimize uh, uh, variance. But of course, the best possible, is to, like just, or not the best possible, but the m most comfortable for us is if we can do it once and it, uh, if it works well enough, that's good. The noising up here, again, the noising up is a, a way, is a trick a method so that we uh, avoid having to compute the gradient of the score function. Because this is a multi-dimensional quantity, right? So it's a vector, S is a vector itself. Then you have to compute each dimension of it. Uh, you have to compute the gradient, so the gradient of the gradient and then compute the trace. So like imagine you have a neural network with like all sorts of thousands and thousands and uh, hundred thousands of pixels. <coughs> yes? On each slide it says that, sorry, it's a little bit open, but that the first one that we're actually trying to optimize is the log value of still in it, or like the, the score function still in it, that the step to the trace that is equivalent to optimizing this is this. And in your words, you said that it was approximation. Yeah, is so if uh, it it I think it's approximation. Like uh, I, I have, I haven't really. Uh, it 
been a while since I read this paper. I think it was, uh, well, not mathematically equivalent, like exactly equivalent, but it's basically yeah, proportional to, okay? If I remember correctly. Uh, the second method we can use to uh, uh, avoid having to compute the trace of the Jacobian of the score function is sliced score matching. And in sliced score matching, <coughs> we, instead of computing, it, it's, it's sort of a computational way of, uh, of <coughs> avoiding uh, uh, the whole thing. So basically, we're using random projections. So if you have, let's say, the basic idea is, you know, like if you have let's say a sphere, then you're taking a random projection and instead of computing uh, like a quantity on the sphere, you compute like let's say the 2D circle projection of it. And like if you take multiple projections, you can approximate very well what's happening on the sphere. Now imagine instead of a sphere, you've got a very high dimensional shape and then your uh, vectors here are your vector planes with you, which you're computing uh, quantities. So instead of having to compute the whole uh, gradient of the score function explicitly, you are uh, using some random projections before and after. And this is like a scalar in the end. Now why is that? So how does this work? We first sample a few vectors V that define the random projection, let's say from a multivariate distribution like a Gaussian. Then we compute this quantity efficiently with forward mode auto differentiation. So you can, yeah, like programmatically, like computationally, it can be efficient enough to compute this term without having to explicitly compute uh, the precise uh, uh, Jacobian. Um, the benefit of it is that it works on the original unnoised distribution, so we don't need noise. However, it requires four times the computation because we have an extra auto differentiation step. So in the forward propagation, we have to have one more auto differentiation uh, to, uh, to compute these quantities. Yes? Uh, why do you sample, like, why do you need the random factors and why don't you use like PTA or something to uh, use dimensions that are for, like combinations of dimensions that, uh, that like um, describe the probability distribution very well? And it's just yeah, so. Uh, why then? If you can. So, random projections are anyways a good approximation. So, uh, let's uh, say uh, uh, that they're actually. Uh, not a bad choice, and usually even with, there are many ways that there are many reasons, uh, how to put it? There are many ways you, you can answer your question. Uh, they're not, uh, let's say, uh, they're orthogonal. So there are multiple reasons why you would you want that. So first of all, a random projection is usually good enough for our uh, procedures because we're optimizing something that we anyways don't really know. So for as long as it's pointing to the correct direction, the gradients, what we really care in the end is to have gradients that look good enough uh, to the true gradients. We don't care about absolute uh, precision. Of course now you could say the better gradients, the better the optimization, right? Uh, uh, Doing the PCA would still require having access to uh, uh, like the uh, Jacobian of the score function because what are you going to do with the PCA on? That's what I'm saying here. Here, this is a clever computational trick. So you got the auto differentiation. This thing, which has the gradient together with uh, the matrix, can be actually implemented in GPU very efficiently, so you don't have to first compute this and then multiply it. Uh, uh, PyTorch, in internal libraries, compute these quantities more efficiently in a computation. So they've got their own like, uh, 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 
like low level functions to compute this type of uh, like uh, vector matrix, multi like vector gradient multiplication very efficiently. So if you can write your quantities in such a form, you may avoid computing explicitly very expensive quantities first and then doing the matrix multiplication. So for instance, you can do it, you know, like for instance, I, mean, I don't remember, I don't know exactly how they implement it. Like I read it like uh, a couple of years ago, but for instance, you can imagine that the ve vector matrix multiplication is basically uh, many, many vector multiplications, right? As in uh, row column multiplication. Now, instead of having, to, uh, instead of requiring um, the whole matrix, like normally when you do uh, this uh, vector matrix multiplication, we would require to have the whole matrix and the vector. And this can have a, uh, like a, a, a cubic complexity, right? And, and, and that, is, that is the expensive uh, part. Now, if you can break this computation into many, many smaller complexity ones, at least in terms of memory, then that's already good enough. Uh, that's why it requires also four times to compute. So you're w winning in memory, but you're increasing your computation because you have to do it sequentially. Is this clear? Yeah. Now this is a perfect example of like deep learning beauty or deep learning magic. <coughs> it's very goal driven, right? Like we've got an actual problem and we want a solution, and we don't care if the solution is purely mathematical or purely computational, or even a mix of two, or even if the, the solution is not even that perfect because of the randomness. If uh, you know, the right combination uh, works, that's the important thing. Um, score matching advantages. We can train with score matching directly using SGD, maximizing the log likelihood. So there is no uh, approximation per se. Uh, of course, if we ignore the fact that, you know, if we add the noise, for instance, here. If we add noise, then it's not exactly the, we don't maximize the likelihood of the true data, but the noise that, but okay, barring that, now we've got a procedure such that we've got uh, energy-based models that are very flexible that we also can uh, optimize very nicely with SGD maximizing the log likelihood without approximations. We have no constraints on the form of our energy function. It can take any form. We don't need reinvertibility. We don't need uh, specific distributions on latents. We don't need we causal convolutions. We just compare our neural network outputs with the ground truth data score. And because we don't have the ground truth data score, uh, there, is, there are clever ways of uh, uh, rewriting this quantity as something that we can actually compute. The only requirement is that the output, so our neural network, is a vector-valued function. So it's a function of not just a single number, like the probability, but it's a function, it's a vector-like value function. So we've got uh, vector outputs. So for instance, like an image. Um, with the same input and output dimensionality. So the dimensions of our input are also the dimensions of our output. Like that's it. So that's the only constraint for our neural network. Any questions? No, okay. So before going, what time is it? Maybe we can take a, a, a break here, but uh, before we take the break, what do you think? Why score functions are, are better than energy based models? Like the traditional, like the RBMs? Yes, we don't have the denominator, we don't have to have complex 
I mean complex learning objectives like contrastive divergence. We don't have to do weird samplings, like we have to sample latents, then do MCMC uh, for one, two, three, n steps. Why is it better than variational autocoders? Is it better than variational autocoders? Yes. Yes, we directly optimize the local likelihood. We don't um, uh, have an elbow, but we directly optimize the local likelihood. But also, I mean, these things are connected. But also, what? Well, okay, I can also answer it myself. It's better if. Uh, <laughs> no. So the latent distribution has a particular form, right? So we're assuming uh, a very specific uh, form uh, for our uh, latents, and this might not be true in the end, right? So we don't make assumptions uh, that we cannot uh, easily uphold to. Why is it better than normalizing flows? Yes, so, so we don't need invertibility. We don't need to have functions for which uh, the log, uh, 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 the determinant of the Jacobian uh, has to be easily computable like in the neural network architecture, I mean. So we've got better flexibility, we've got more choices for functions. Basically, any function works here. Okay, yes? Uh, we also make approximations here in optimizing, right? So how? Uh, which approximation? So there are two types of approximation. No, I mean, more like, does it does here you like better approximations than the elbow is supposed to be? Sorry, it's uh, come again. Is there like these are more effective approximations than like using the elbow for PAD? Um, so this is not really an approximation. Well, it is. Uh, it's uh, th that's a hard question somehow. Uh, uh, I think that uh, with VAs and with elbows, the approximation you make is uh, uh, is. Uh, you know, very explicit, this core to the optimization. Uh, when we go from this quantity, optimizing this quantity to this quantity, we don't really approximate. We more, at least in the paper, they show, it's a very, actually a very interesting derivation, but um, uh, they show that by optimizing this, it is proportional to optimizing this. It's not like that it approximates it, but if you approximate this, uh, sorry, if you maximize this, it means that you also maximize the original object. So like, that's it. So you can call it an approximation in the sense that we are not really um, having, uh, like estimating this quantity, uh, but, uh, um, you know, in the end, we don't really care because this original quantity is not something that we can uh, uh, compute anyways. For as long as uh, the objective uh, is sensible, uh, that is good enough. Whereas VAEs make an explicit approximation of the learning objective. We say we've got maximum likelihood, we cannot compute it, so we're going to assume that there is a, pro uh, a latent distribution with a very specific assumption for uh, you know, what kind of parametric form it has. There's always a gap. You know, you can never uh, make this disappear unless you use better priors, like with normalizing flows. And this is an explicit approximation. So I, the way I see this is more like saying we're having a different learning objective. That is a, a very interesting uh, point, however. Like learning objective, what's the point of a learning objective? Like you just need to, like you just need like a rule how you find the best possible parameters, right? And why maximum, uh, like maximum likelihood is a good learning objective? Well, based on probability theory, right? Like you're saying that uh, I want to have models that give high enough probability on my uh, known samples. Like that's the only reason. But it doesn't have to be, you know, like that's not the only learning objective. Uh, it's not even true because uh, really, because um, uh, what we really care about is making good probability estimations in uh, new samples, in unseen samples. So it's not just about maximizing the likelihood 
only on the training set, but also making sure that we don't overfit, right? So approximation is always, or anyway, some form of, uh, uh, like purity is not, um, uh, you're gonna find purity in that sense in, in learning. And uh, that's how I see it. Uh, uh, the approximation of VE is making an explicit approximation, whereas here, it's just that we're just changing the learning objective and you know, you can agree or disagree whether the learning objective makes sense or not but you don't really make an approximation anymore. It's just a different learning objective. Uh, let's have the break, like 10 minutes break, and uh, we start at five minutes past time. <laughs> 